Hey guys, Steve Foster here, and welcome to the second orientation session for the 2016 Guatemala trip for Spanish for Educators. I'm really looking forward to the session. I'm also looking forward to meeting you guys down in Guatemala, coming up here in a little over a month. Before we get started, a couple of plugs as far as books go, as we're kind of having people connect. First of all, and this was on the uh, packing list that I shared with you guys right after last session, please make sure that you have a pocket Spanish dictionary. Doesn't really matter what kind, they're all very similar. I would rather it be personally smaller and more compact, but then of course you sacrifice on the number of words. Um, and if you do get a small one, then you can also supplement it with, and you can keep this at home, you don't have to bring it with you everywhere you go, but something that uh, focuses on verbs. So I have one that I got when I was down in Chile, or maybe it was Argentina, I forget, I think it was Chile. Um, there's a book many of you may know called 501 Spanish Verbs. It's the 501 series. It's for many different languages. Very helpful, I think, for vocab development, verb, uh, verb conjugation, which are arguably two of the most important aspects of Spanish language acquisition. Um, so I would, you know, I would recommend getting something, whether it be something like this, which is kind of a, I, f I found it at a local bookstore in Chile, so I don't know if you could grab this, but the 501 Spanish verbs, it is a little bit bigger, um, but it's something that I think is worth your space in your suitcase. And then, of course, we have a guidebook. Um, this one is the Rough Guide to Guatemala. There's also, of course, Lonely Planet, which is a good one. Those would be the two that I'd recommend. Um, the main time that you're going to have, unless you're coming up or going down early or staying late, is going to be that weekend, um, the middle weekend that we have. And so the two, the three options that I'm going to be sending out as far as side trips, and you're welcome to go and coordinate your own, are going to be either the uh, Pacaya Volcano Tour, um, which is a hike that's doesn't go to the top of the volcano. It goes to a little area that has some uh, flows. It's an active volcano. You get to roast some marshmallows, and it's pretty fun. And then um, that's one option. Another is what's called uh, Playa Villarica, or no, Playa Monterico. And so that is a black sand beach. Uh, you know, great place to hang out, get some... Uh, get some sun, uh, relax a little bit. Um, it's basically just a beach and a couple restaurants and bars and stuff like that. And then the third uh, option that I'll give to you guys uh, from my perspective is the Lake Lago Atitlan. Um, and that's always great. It's a nice, beautiful lake. There's volcanoes surrounding it. It's probably about a three-hour ride each way. Um, there's also a lot of Airbnb options as far as accommodations. Um, so what I'll do is I'll probably just offer transportation if you wanted to do that and uh, provide your own Airbnb option. Then that's totally, uh, I think that would probably be the easiest and that'll allow you to kind of be flexible. Um, so anyways, and then of course we have the um, Silence on the Mountain. So, um, again, a little bit more uh, regarding the political struggles in Guatemala that have happened over the past half century, which I'll get into a little bit more in the form of a lesson plan. Um, it's a little bit more dense. It's not necessarily your summer reading, but um, for those people who are historians and who, uh, you know, like to go into the politics and especially Cold War politics and how the U.S. has affected other countries throughout the Cold War, and then, of course, we have Rigoberto Menchu. Um, so I would love to be able to have some sort of a discussion circle that we can get started as far as just kind of basic notices on one side and wonderings on the other side 
for those people that have had a chance to be able to go through this book or maybe one column that has like quotes or something like that. So I'll put that down on my to-do list as far as sharing a Google document with you guys where you can kind of just capture your thoughts on the Rigoberto Menchu book. And again, for those people that haven't gotten this book, I, I have it on my to-do list to get the, the book out to both of the Melissa's. Um, but besides that, I think I either have sent out a book to everybody or haven't gotten confirmation on your t-shirt size because I also have a Spanish for Educators t-shirt for each of you. So make sure that you're getting that over to me so I can get, get that book and that t-shirt out to you. Okay, so before we go over the... Um, Before we go over the agenda and get going here, I just wanted to very quickly go through the, here we go, facilitators that you guys are going to have. Um, so obviously me, um, and this is on the document that you guys uh, have created, that we've created together. Tiffany Higgins is going to be uh, one of the facilitators. Um, she comes to us uh, with a, a lot of experience in the education realm at all three levels, uh, primary, uh, elementary school, middle school, and high school. And now she is a professional facilitator for professional development. Um, she's, uh, more than anything, an excellent person. Um, and I think that she's a great addition. Uh, she was with us last year as well as a facilitator. Um, and she is going to be leading the uh, one of the school groups that goes into um, uh, the Guatemalan school. It's called El Hato, which she was also at last year. Um, and so there's some information about her there. Blanca is our first uh, Guatemalan facilitator. She is uh, from just outside of Antigua and... Uh, she is going to be uh, coming to us from another organization that I've been a part of that's called Global Visionaries. Highly recommended, and I'm super excited to have her on board. And she is um, has already been super helpful in getting our uh, getting our school uh, situation set up as far as our Guatemalan public schools. So she's going to be leading the San Miguel Escobar uh, group as far as the school shadowing and volunteer experience. So there's some information about her as well. Okay. Agenda. Culture Shock. A little bit more about Culture Shock. Um, some resources. Uh, information on the family homestay groups and family information, although not as much as I would have hoped to give you. We had a couple snafus, so we're going to get the uh, the actual pairings as far as your family information is going to be up here in the next few days, so I apologize for that in advance. And then we do have the information on the Guatemalan schools, including the materials that are needed at each school. And again, most of that is due to the hard work of Blanca. So thanks to Blanca for that. And then some question and answer. Um, and I think that it would probably be best if you just want to send it on the email. If you do have a question that comes up, you know, that Q&A thing for Google uh, is, is a little bit rough. It's so much easier for me to just have my phone out and get some questions on my phone via email. So why don't we go ahead and do that instead of the Q&A. So again, info at SpanishForEducators.org. Culture Shock. Uh, this is a, a graph courtesy of, I believe it's the Consortium for International Education and Multicultural Studies. Um, there's also some information if you go, I, I sent uh, this presentation that has this link if you click on that, it has some more information than, than you'll ever need about culture shock. The main three things here is you're going to go through a honeymoon period. You may encounter some crisis as you uh, are in Guatemala. And that's kind of, as we talked about last time with the zone of proximal development, kind of your danger zone, where you may need to go and uh, speak some English or you know call home or whatever the case may be. Um, and then you're going to 
potentially do some adjustment. However, just as an asterisk here, this graph is typically thought of uh, for somebody that's going to be spending six months to a year in another culture. So you very well could only be in the honeymoon phase, or you might be honeymoon and just getting into a little of, you know, spatters here and there of culture shock. So, uh, but, you know, this is something where it goes over the state of mind, uh, and just because, you know, for your first four to five days, you know, everything seems well and great as far as encountering various cultural differences doesn't mean that it's going to stay like that. So I always like to have that uh, graph available for you guys, and again, the extra, the extra reading. But again, this, is, this graph is for uh, six to 12 months typically. A uh, few logistical and other items. Um, as we do go, uh, when we're down there in Guatemala especially, it would be very helpful for you to uh, be on the Facebook page because I'd love it if you guys could post photos that you're taking to that Facebook page for Spanish for Educators. So thank you to the people that have already done that. And uh, for those who haven't, um, if you'd be able to, that would be great. Uh, we typically, for the last few years, have also done a Shutterfly share uh, share site where everybody has a place to dump their photos uh, where uh, it's kind of like a little share site as far as um, you can see what everybody else has. Sometimes there's, there's going to be one or two people that might bring a better camera or something like that that it might be a better quality than just having like a phone-based camera or what have you. So... So anyways, uh, it'd be good to get onto that Facebook page. Also, you know, with that in mind, if you don't want anything published to Facebook or any type of uh, marketing that I, that I might do in the future or anything like that, please let me know. Please email me to opt out of that sort of thing. Um, otherwise, um, that could be a possibility as far as, um, you know, your picture showing up on, on, on our Facebook page or whatever whatever the case may be, so please let me know if that's something that you, you know, everybody's different, and I get that, so that's totally fine, just let me know, just send me an email and say, hey, I'd, I'd prefer not to be in any type of marketing stuff. So this is what I was referring to earlier, um, and this is something that, uh, as a social studies teacher, it is a social studies based lesson, uh, the core uh, target is uh, more in the secondary realm. Uh, I am a seventh grade teacher and uh, it is right on the edge of being a little bit too intense for seventh graders. Um, so I really have to uh, front load it a lot as far as my communication with parents and that sort of thing. Um, but basically um, it's got a primary source declassified CIA document and it shows students how um, the United States, as well as on the other side, Russia, slash, you know, AKA the Soviet Union, um, went into other countries that they considered their satellite countries, and they participated in regime change operations. Uh, in the case of Guatemala, the CIA um, assisted um, the counter revolutionaries as far as a, a lot of different things, including genocide. So the trick is to be able to present both sides, which is best practice for social studies. So that's one thing that I've, as I've gone through this, I've started to find things that mimic what the U.S. did in Guatemala with the Soviet Union and other countries, a.k.a. Cuba, for example. Um, so anyways, um, it's, a, it's, it's powerful. It, it involves primary sources, which is something that... Um, you know, having a declassified CIA document, the kids love that. Um, it's called a study of assassination. So that's another thing, is that it has some violence in it, which is more appropriate for the higher secondary levels and also more appropriate to front load it and, um, and tell parents and make sure that they have a chance to opt out if they want. But it's, it's a great way to present uh, the Cold War and specifically... Guatemala's involvement in the Cold War to kids. Also, and I'm not sure why it's coming up a little bit kooky there, but it's called uh, my, my cousin, Krishan Olsen, um, who is uh, 
currently not uh, in a professorship. She is raising her two young kids, but uh, she has been out on the West Coast, and I believe it was the University of Washington and also the University of Berkeley, uh, UC Berkeley. And um, so her PhD uh, publication was called Youth Without Sanctuary, The New Ethics of Humanitarianism, Humanitarianism in Postwar Guatemala. So you've got the text there, it's very long, but there's also a synopsis, and uh, basically it gets into uh, the effect that the, the war had on youth in, uh, in Guatemala, specifically where she was at, which was Neba, which was kind of uh, one of the main areas that the civil war uh, was fought at, and so she studied the effect of the war on children. Moving on to the family homestay, a um, couple of just pr uh, just precursors here. Um, the what I will be basing it off of, and the thing is with the family homestay guys, we're still uh, needing to get a couple of uh, additional families. We've had some shuffling, and which you know it happens in one situation. For example, the uh, the Guatemalan family uh, had a grandchild, I believe it was, that was coming back from either a job or college. So the room that they were giving out to our participants uh, is no longer available. So our homestay coordinator, another Guatemalan by the name of Amparo, which I'll give you a little profile of here, here in a little bit as well, um, she asked for a couple of additional days to be able to make sure that we have uh, sufficient space to be able to have a nice place for everybody. We could we could do it right now, but we we like to make it so there's no more than four people at each house, and ideally maybe even less than that. So that's one of the things is that we have there are families that we work with that have like, you know, five or six rooms available, each each of which can accompany two to three people, and so, but that's not as good on the quality side and on your your cultural experience. So, so that's why uh, we're uh, going to take a couple of days and get that to you the right way. But when we do it, it's going to be based off of your preferences as far as if you have a coworker or family that uh, you said you wanted to stay with, then we'll respect that. Um, shared interests, where we, that's why we said what are some things that you like to do when you're not teaching, et cetera, et cetera. So we'll try to get some of those things. Uh, your arrival dates, so we have, I believe it's three people that will be arriving a week early, and so we typically try to get those three people together, or at least, uh, you know, maybe two of them together and then one of them somewhere else. Um, and so, um, and then also, uh, we, we sometimes will also group you according to educational things, like if you're a third grade teacher and there's another third grade teacher. Then we'll put we we might put you together so you have something to talk like as far uh, about as far as that goes. So um, and then sometimes we also will do dietary preferences where if we have two vegetarians, uh, then it's better to have them at the same house as opposed to you know having a, a host family prepare two different meals for at three different houses. So. You know, logistical simplicity like that, uh, and we have a couple families that are really good for vegetarian or allergies or gluten or vegan or whatever the case may be. So, if you answered that on your registration part two, then uh, then that might be some. You know, you might be grouped with somebody who answered similarly. Family stay coordinator is Amparo Cuellar. Uh, she has been my host mother uh, basically since I've started, well, not right since I've started coming to Guatemala in 1997, but uh, for a while now. And she has been a host mother for many years. Um, she has a, a lovely house very close to the Spanish school that we will be at. And as we prepare for departure, I will send you guys uh, contact information for her. Um, and she can be one of our main points of contact as far as anything that comes up for you at your host family experience. Um, so, so she's a great resource. She's an amazing woman, and um, she is also the family stay coordinator for the trip. A few things that I wanted to make sure to front load as well regarding the um, host families. 
Guatemala is a developing country, so um, most homes in Antigua and Guatemala have only one toilet. Um, I have set up some arrangements where, you know, uh, it's typically it's going to be a better situation than most Guatemala that you guys will be in than most Guatemalans have. Um, but it might be a little bit more uh, cramped, if you will, uh, than you're used to. Um, so, for example, uh, all homes there are there is no air conditioning. Um, luckily for us in Guatemala, it's at I think 4,700 feet or something like that in Antigua, and so it's not going to be super hot all the time. It's the rainy season, so they actually call it the winter. So as long as it it is in fact raining or like raining regularly, then that provides a welcome relief to uh, you know what the climate would be for those people that have been to Mexico and that sort of thing. You know it can get pretty steamy, um, but it's not going to be like that necessarily. Hopefully, sometimes they have something called the canicula, which makes it so it's sunny and humid and and pretty pretty uncomfortably warm. So that is a possibility. Uh, solo Dios quiere, or solo Dios sabe. Um, but anyways, uh, there's no screens on the windows, so that's another thing that people are uh, have a hard time getting used to is that the mosquitoes aren't that bad, but sometimes the flies will come in or there's a fly or uh, various, you know, bugs like that. So if that's something that's bothersome to you, you might want to go out to REI or to a, uh outdoor shop and get like a compact uh, mosquito sheet kind of thing that you can put over yourself as you're sleeping. Um, and then also often the extended family will often live uh, with the family that you'll be at. So in many situations there's like a grandson or a granddaughter or a grandmother or grandfather, uh, etc, etc. Um, there is a good chance that there will be some internet at your home not that's not guaranteed but there is a good chance but for example in Ampato's home where I stay um, there is internet but in order to be able to get the internet you have to have your device like right where the router is which in Ampato's case is in the dining room and even then uh, if I were to attempt to which I have to do like FaceTime or Skype with my wife or my daughters um, it's not necessarily going to work that well because the router is, the modem is pretty weak. So what I'll do typically with my wife is I will just do the FaceTime voice, which is an option where you don't have the video. Um, so anything that requires a lot of bandwidth, like like video, you're not going to be able to do very easily. Um, however, you will be able to, if you need to do that sort of thing, or if you'd like to do FaceTime with your family back home or Skype, then you can always go to an internet store. There's a lot of different areas that you can pay. Typically, it's going to be like a dollar an hour or something like that, and you can uh, use their internet, and typically it's more like broadband and that sort of thing. So the Spanish school has uh, better internet, so where we'll be at when you have your break, um, that's going to be a time either before school, during the break, or after school. The little courtyard is available for you to uh, to get onto the wireless network. Uh, so what I do is I bring my uh, my phone, my iPhone, and I just have it on airplane mode the entire time, and then I'll I'll uh, tap into the wireless network whether I'm at Ampato's house or at um, the Spanish school. So um, so that's a little. Uh, little information about the host families. So what I have uh, negotiated with uh, and made sure that uh, we're transparent with the families is that there will be no more than two people per bedroom. So you may have a roommate, you may not. Um, if you do, you'll have your own bed, uh, except in the case where we have our uh, husband and wife combination who are going with us. Um, and then there will be no more than four total people per bathroom. As far as the meals go, you see, and for me personally, like I'm the type of person that I'm used to just having a bowl of cereal for breakfast in the morning and, a, and some coffee. And so it's much more than, than I'm used to as far as that goes, where there's usually also a protein and some fruit and uh, that sort of thing for breakfast. And then you'll either get a protein... Uh, 
for lunch or dinner. You're not necessarily uh, going to have uh, protein for... Oh, okay. You'll have meat for either lunch or dinner if you're not a vegetarian, and you'll have some form of protein for lunch and dinner. Um, and then the thing that I really stress is right down here, at least one member of the family will sit at the table for conversation for each meal, hopefully more. So typically with our families, it's going to be where they, once they know that that's something that we want, they really take pride in sitting down and, and, and having conversations and teaching you about the Guatemalan culture and about themselves and that sort of thing and collaborating in that way. But sometimes uh, in the past, before we made that clear with our families, it was kind of a respect thing where they would kind of sit sit back behind and, or wait in the kitchen or whatever. And it's like, no, like this is a part of the host family experience is we need to all you know sit down and eat together. There will be purified water, unlimited purified water, which is why it's super uh, important for you to bring like an empty Nalgene water bottle or some sort of an empty water bottle um, so that you can fill up that water at your family homestay. And then the Spanish school will also have the big jugs of water, like the office jugs of water um, at both your family as well as the Spanish school that you can take unlimited quantities. Um, there will be no meals on Sundays. So when you come in from your flight, most of you will be coming in on Sunday, July 10th. Um, I have asked families to provide some sort of a snack since you're going to be traveling and that sort of thing. So you'll get like maybe a sandwich or a light snack, some fruit, something like that. Um, but it is a Sunday, so that's something extra that they don't usually do. Um, but they, I, I said, you know, that they're traveling and that sort of thing, so they're they're fine with that. Um, the Sunday in between, where we have our, our weekend uh, in between the two weeks, um, and for those people that are arriving uh, a week early, uh, don't expect meals on Sunday. That's a day for the family to rest. It is a very Catholic society, so that's where they have their Sabbath. They go to church. Um, and they have their, their rest day and their family time. So so as far as your spending money goes, I believe we touched on this last time, but uh, please plan on bringing uh, maybe an extra, uh, what ends up being converted to Quetzales, like I would say 20 US dollars for that Sunday. If you wanted to, there's a really neat brunch place that's called uh, Cerro del Tenedor, that's part of uh, Hotel Santo Domingo, which is one of the five-star hotels. So that's like a five-star hotel. So, you know, if you want to do that sort of thing, then bring more money. But you can get, like, typical Guatemalan food for, you know, a good meal for the neighborhood of five U.S. dollars and dinner uh, for maybe a little bit more. But it's very reasonable. Here's where we're going to put our groups in. So I'll share this out with you guys once we get them. Moving on, changing gears a little bit. And actually, before I do this, let me see if we've got any questions here. Um, let's see here. So again, Blanca has been great as far as coordinating the Spanish schools. Doesn't look like we have any questions just yet, so, so I'll keep going here. Um, we have two schools that we're going to be working with this time. Um, they are both elementary schools. Uh, unfortunately, we weren't able to finalize anything as far as a secondary school. And again, guys, that's very realistic to Guatemala because typically, uh, especially in the rural areas, which is where one of our schools is, um, but across the board, a lot of kids don't go through sixth grade. Um, so um, there aren't... And, and once you go past sixth grade, it's more of a technical school um, atmosphere where there's going to be a, a, a colegio secundario that's like based on nursing and based on being a teacher and based on uh, various uh, professional fields. So, so, um, so that both of the sites are primary. School number one is uh, in a community called El Hato, which is uh, on the side of a mountain um, about 15 minutes outside of Antigua. Um, it is a public elementary school that has 286 students. Um, Pati is the principal. 
we've been there for the last three years. Uh, school number two is uh, a new school for us, but I'm super excited for it. Um, it's a larger urban uh, type of school, which is in a city called Ciudad Vieja, um, which actually used to be the capital, the Spanish colonial capital of Guatemala, which is uh, very close to Antigua, but it is a different city. Um, it's actually larger than Antigua. Um, but this, uh, the neighborhood that it's in, or the community, is called uh, San Miguel Escobar, and which happens to be the uh, home community of Blanca. So um, it's a larger school. It's an urban school. There's 625 students, um, and we're really looking forward to being a part of the uh, our, our new school at San Miguel Escobar. And again. Um, at El Hato, Tiffany is going to be the site leader. At San Miguel Escobar, Blanca is going to be the site leader. I will also be uh, kind of rotating back and forth, and I'll be available for participants, uh, for any of you guys who, you know, might need a little bit of assistance as far as uh, getting more comfortable in your classroom or that sort of thing. So, so in the past, I've actually been in a classroom, the same classroom every day, just like everybody else, but... I wanted to make myself available for people that, you know, if, in case you guys, you know, would like to have somebody else in there or would like to, you know, you have, you're confused or you're kind of uh, culturally or struggling or whatever the case may be. So that's how it's going to be this year. Okay. So uh, as far as our end kind donations, and this is something that has already been arranged. It's already coming out of your tuition. So it's not anything extra that you guys have to have to do. Um, each Guatemalan teacher will receive an in-kind donation of 35 US dollars uh, that will be materials. It's not like money, it's they're going to be getting materials. And then the administrative office or the school as a whole will receive $15 for each Spanish for Educators participant. So at El Hato, I believe we have 10 uh, people there and at, or maybe 9, and at uh, San Miguel Escobar, I believe we have eight. So you multiply that by 15, and that's what the school as a whole gets as far as a material in-kind do donation. Um, we, uh, and again, much thanks to Blanca on this, uh, went and met with the principal and some of the teachers at each school, got some information, and they wrote down some of the materials that they need. And so... The thing is, is that if you have any of this stuff, whether your school has it and they have extra, or whether uh, you did want to go out and get some of the stuff, or whatever the case may be, great. Like, for example, Canon MP230 printer cartridges. That's something where um, I'm probably going to get those, unless somebody has those like lying around or something like that, I'm probably going to go to Walmart or Office Depot or Staples here because actually um, with that sort of thing, a lot of times it's cheaper to get that here versus waiting until you go to Guatemala. Um, but, you know, like puzzles. Like there's themes that are requested like number puzzles, animals, oh, animales, animals puzzles, land and aquatic animals, transportation, like different types of cars and trucks and stuff, plants, family. Um, USBs. I don't know about you guys, but when I go to various uh, professional developments and conferences and stuff like that, sometimes they'll just give out USBs that have stuff on them. But all you have to do is you just clear out all the stuff that, you know, or put that somewhere else, and then you have a blank USB. Um, they were asking for USBs that are 16 gigs or higher, but um, if you have ones that are lower than that, you know, they're very uh, small as far as the amount of. Uh, packing that you need to do, like with your suitcase, so if you've got any extra, it's a good opportunity for you to do some cleansing too, right? Um, and then some of the basics, whiteboard markers, masking tape, it, you know, if you have an electric pencil sharpener lying around. Um, but this is stuff that if you guys don't have it, uh, then, then not a big deal, or if you're not going to go get it, because we have uh, an amount of money from your tuition designated to... Um, to procure that stuff. So, um, but I thought that I would at least share with you this uh, list here as far as the items that, like storybooks in Spanish. You know, like last year, 
one of our participants worked at a bilingual uh, elementary school and they were uh, the library at this school was going through and uh, clearing out some of their items that had been outdated for example um, or curriculum like textbooks if anybody has any Spanish language math or um, any type of uh, reading textbooks or a teacher's guide like the the classroom that I've been in for the last two years well I've traveled with the students so I was with two different I was with second grade and then third grade they basically had one um, student edition of their math textbook and and that was it so there was no teacher edition that had the answers in it and stuff it was just one student edition so any type of stuff that either a you have extra your school has extra or B you have the ability to put in your uh, in your suitcase without going over the weight limit or without going over the number of uh, allowable items that you have um, then please do that would be great um, so I tried to match you with a similar grade is this called the seating chart okay we'll call it that um, for those people like we have a couple eighth grade teachers we have a Spanish teacher um, we have a high school teacher um, you know since we're not in a secondary school there's not much we can do about that but I did put you in an upper level uh, grade so it's not like you're gonna be with uh, preschoolers except in the situation with our art teacher that we have um, the first grade teachers that I've been that we have been working with uh, there's a lot of art uh, it, you know it's geared a lot towards art at least from what from what they said on their materials request and also from what I've noticed in the past and from what our participants have noticed so I did put the art teacher that we have with um, a lower level um, grade even though I believe she teaches like eighth grade art or something like that so um, but please maintain an open mind it's mainly just uh, you know learning about the culture which is one of our main objectives um, try not to compare it to what how it is in the United States um, because if you do that's going to be you know it's unfair with the amount of resources that we have versus what they have with what our teachers are required versus what their teachers are required to go through as far as training and licensure um, and the fact that it's a public school unfortunately there's still a lot of corruption in Guatemala and so the money that's designated for public schools often does not end up in the hands of the schools uh, unfortunately uh, one of my Guatemalan friends at one point told me that the only thing that was paid for with public money uh, was the paint that paints the Guatemalan flag um, to show that it's a public school um, I'll take that a little bit further in saying that a lot of times they do fund the majority of the salaries of the teachers although the salaries are in, insufficient um, but for example at El Hato I think they fund like let's say that there are um, let's say that there are uh, 15 teachers at El Hato and uh, and I believe that the Guatemalan government funds like 12 of those 15 and then NGOs fund the other ones or volunteers um, so so anyways there's a link here that has the pairings and also I have it on the next page here so I'll just stay on here for just a few minutes um, so you can see where you are going to be so over here on the right column uh, we've got all of uh, your guys's names and then on the left we've got some information about what school you're at the name of the principal the site leader, um, the name of your collaborating teacher, grade level, age range of the students, number of students in the class. So as you are going through this I hope that you start to notice a couple of things. First off, has anybody heard of a third grade classroom that has 47 students in it? Okay, I didn't think so. If so, you've got, you know, three to four paraprofessionals or you know a special a certified special education teacher um, so yeah we've got second grade 37 preschool 35 um, and then down here fourth grade 39 so that's one thing and then also we've got third grade 
age range, 9 to 15 years old, 10 to 14 on 4th grade, 10 to 13 on 4th grade, 12 to 15 on 6th grade, 11 to 15 on 5th grade. So as opposed to, you know, saying, you know, where is there a place in the U.S. that has 47 students in a class, try to take it for what it is as far as based on the resources, based on the uh, situation and uh, the corruption that takes place in the government, uh, this is how it is. And, um, and so it's, that's, that's not our uh, place necessarily to uh, compare, I don't think, uh, as much as it is to volunteer and provide anything that our collaborating teachers need, um, observe and notice what, you know, how it is, and then also help out as far as, you know, with the materials that we're providing, as well as with whatever it is that, uh, as you're going through and collaborating with your teacher, whatever it is that they need. So this is, again, available um, on the uh, presentation that I sent out to you guys today. Um, Packing list, I already sent that out, so um, check your emails. If you can't find it, then I do have, um, then I can't, I'm, I'm happy to send it out again. Um, but right after, I believe it was like three or four days after last session, I did send out an email that had a link to the packing list. Um, so as you're getting closer to departure, um, make sure that you are going through that. Specifically in regards to, like I had said, pocket dictionary, water bottle, um, any type of medication that you need. Some people, uh, I would recommend that you get the, uh, um, the antibiotics that if you go to a travel clinic and you get your typhoid typically and your hepatitis shots or any other shots updated that you need, um, they will say, do you want the pills for in case you get sick? And I would just say yes. It's typically not that expensive. Um, and then... Other than that, please also remember on your packing list that you will have access to a very inexpensive laundromat that does a great job that, um, that I would recommend. So as opposed to bringing more of items, I would bring less of uh, each uh, item and plan to bring it to the laundromat at least maybe after that first week. So you pretty much only have to, I think, uh, put in enough clothes for one week and then you can at least, or maybe even less and then you can go to the laundromat once or twice. Um, map of Antigua. So I'm going to be sharing with you guys a Google map that I've created that has different uh, sp spots on it as far as all of the various homestay families that has the Spanish school that has some points of interest as far as Parque Central and various uh, museums like the Chocolate Museum that they have and the Jade Museum and different things like that in Antigua um, and the laundromat and to then um, so I will be sharing that with you guys so that you have that as kind of a reference that's basically what we will also be doing on our first uh, that first Monday and for the people that are arriving a week early, that's something that Blanca will be doing with you guys. She'll be taking you guys on an orientation walk where she'll kind of show you where all the different uh, necessities are, whether it be like the bank where you can exchange money or that has a an ATM or Parque Central or some good, you know, cafes, um, different things like that, as well as the laundromat, as well as the Spanish school. Uh, so you can become comfortable and orient yourself. So that's going to be coming as well. Um, we already talked about weekend excursions. Um, so I'll be getting you guys some options as far as that goes. You're also welcome to find that on your own. The Spanish school that we're working with uh, has a separate travel agency. So you're welcome, you know, since I use them for our Spanish school, I would prefer that you that you use them as well. If you're not going to use um, the options that, that we're going to provide you, then I would recommend using uh, the Spanish school, which is called La Union. Um, but, you know, there's tons of different uh, travel agency type tour companies that they basically all do the exact same thing. They have uh, 
airport trips that go to the airport. Um, they have uh, the ones that I'm that I'm telling you guys about as far as the Lake Atitlan, volcano, and beach. And then there's a few other ones. Uh, if you do get that rough guide or the Lonely Planet, and it says like these can't miss things of Guatemala, they'll usually provide uh, transportation and tours for all of those items. They also provide uh, excursions to Tikal. So let's talk about that for those people that signed up for the Tikal trip. Here's the itinerary here. Um, so day one is Sunday, or I'm sorry, Saturday, July 23rd. So we've got day one is the 23rd, day two, 24th, day three, 25th. And then your uh, departure trip should be for the 26th. Um, so uh, we will have accommodations on day one and day two. It's basically inside of Tikal National Park. It's a very primitive location. It's called the, I mean, it's nice, but it's not something where, like, the grid goes out there all the way. So the Tikal Inn, it has, it's run on a generator, um, and the generator only runs from, uh, I believe it's 6 until 8 a.m. and then 7 until 9 p.m. Um, so it's really nice as far as there's screens, uh, there's bug screens on these, uh, as opposed to Antigua where there's not bug screens in the houses, this, these, this hotel does have bug screens, partially because it's a necessity. You're in the rainforest, you're in the jungle, and you need it. Um, there's fans. Um, but the fans need to run off of electricity, so the only time that you can power those fans is uh, the time that the generator is on. Um, there are some meals that will be provided for this, so not all meals, which was specified on the website when you signed up for this, this extension, but for example, um, the lunch that you get when you're going on the Tikal, uh, that is going to be provided, although you need to bring your own beverage in advance. Um, there is a tour of Tikal National Park that's included in the trip. Um, your entrance into the National Park uh, is uh, provided in the trip, um, as well as all the transfers, the airfare, things like that. Um, there is an optional sunrise tour that I would highly recommend, but if you did want to do that, make sure that you're bringing along an extra 35 US dollars, or the equivalent in Quetzales, as well as um, a few meals. Um, so you know, your breakfast will be provided here by your host family because it's a Saturday. Uh, you could even get your host family probably to uh, pack you a lunch. The, the flight does provide you with a really nice, like, nuts and stuff like that. Um, but then you need to get your lunch, possibly lunch, and then definitely dinner here. Um, and then plan for breakfast and dinner here. And then breakfast here. Oh, and lunch. So, so yeah, as far as budget goes, that is something that um, make sure that you're budgeting for that as well. Although, I think there might be one breakfast that the last time we did this that was kind of a surprise that was like, yes, they're actually they're giving us breakfast, which I think is on day two here. Um, but budget for it just in case. Because it did say when you guys signed up for it that it wasn't going to be providing any meals. So, um but yeah, I mean, T-Call's great, uh, really looking forward to it. We had a lot of fun. There's a swimming pool at the T-Call Inn, so this first day here, you can sit by the pool and relax. That's what most people end up doing. The You can, you know, there's a little bar slash restaurant at the T-Call Inn that you can have your stuff brought out to the pool, and it's, you know, it's like a rainforest, so it's really hot and muggy, so... It's, it's fun to just kind of sit out back there at the pool and hang out and, uh, you know, just relax. Um, you can explore the National Park, uh, go into the pyramids and stuff. Uh, there's uh, guides that I can recommend to you as far as that will take you in there, or you can go in there by yourself. Um, make sure, you know, safety-wise that you're going with somebody else if you do that. Uh, but we'll, we'll talk about this, kind of more of the details as we go along. Okay, let me go into our questions here. We're at 47 minutes, so that's not too bad. Well, 
doesn't look like we have any questions. Let me just check one more time our... Okay, so I'm going to go into our Q&A here, just in case. No questions. Okay, well, thanks, guys. Um, really looking forward to the trip. I know that Tiffany and Blanca are as well, as well as Amparo and her family, as well as Mauricio and the crew at Moreno Transportation, which will be helping us out as far as all of our various transportation needs. Um, your transportation from the airport, our transportation to El Hato and San Miguel Escobar, as well as the coffee plantation, as well as the Mayan cultural tour that we're going to be going to. That's really awesome. Um, so, yeah, they're looking forward to it as well. Um, and I really want to thank you guys for being a part of the session, for being a part of the cohort. And if you do have any materials that are on that list that, um, you know, you might want to just send a quick email saying, like, you know, I have this, and I'll put together a list that, you know, so we know kind of, so we can take an inventory before we actually go down there as far as what people are, in fact, bringing. Um, but, you know, we'll have, uh, we're going to be going on a run to a, uh, it's kind of like a Walmart type place slash Target, but it's more of a grocery store, but they have a office supply section called Bodegona. So we're going to go to Bodegona and then Amparo's daughter, Ingrid, who is also a Spanish teacher, um, she owns a lib libreria, which is like a bookstore slash office supply store that she has a little kind of hole-in-the-wall store, and so she always also helps us to procure those items. So thank you very much. Have an amazing June. Enjoy the weather. Hopefully you're getting as good a weather as we have here in Colorado, although for our other Colorado participants, you already know that it has been a little bit uh, multiple personalities as far as the rain and and then sun and hot and thunderstorms and hail. But hey, that's Colorado, right? All right, guys. Thank you very much, and uh, let me know if you have any questions. Take care.